for, for what they're going to do. Uh, I, I think when you look at the conference, you know, uh, St. Mary's, you know, they did their, they're consistently a tournament team. Uh, San Francisco, you know, they made a tournament and they're sort of rebuilding in a sense with, with a new, with new leadership. So you're not going to expect too, too much from them. But I think a team that, that I'm sort of looking for is, is, is Pepperdine. You know, Lorenzo Omar, you know, he's had one decent year, and that's with Colby Ross and, and Kessler Edwards. But even then, you know, they, they weren't able to truly compete, you know, towards the top of the league. You mm -hmm. know, this year you have several quality guards, obviously led by Houston Millett. Uh, people thought he was going to be a transfer candidate this offseason. You know, if he's a guy that averages 18 to 20, which is very, which is very in his, which could very easily happen. Yep. If he, if he does that and they still finish in the bottom half, what purpose does he have is to stick around, especially knowing that the Pac-12 and Mountain West teams will easily come calling. So they're going to have to do, they're going to have to prove that they can take another step and look competitive to keep this core and to potentially add new pieces. And if you're Lorenzo Omar, you know, you're, you're obviously, I don't think uh, power conference coach uh, programs are, are looking at him right now until, you know, he sort of builds it up, sort of like how Kyle Smith did with the Dons. But this is a big year for him as well, because who knows when you're going to be able to strike hot again with another guard going from Ross to now Millett and back-to-back -back years. Right. And then even looking at the rest of that roster, like the Maxwell Lewis's and um, some of the other guys that they have on that roster, like they're, it, there's talent on that roster. I think there's never been a question of like uh, Romar's ability to recruit. <laughs> it's always been that follow-up of like, can we see the results in the win-loss column? Um, yeah, I yeah, I see that. Like I see like Pepper and I having a lot to prove. Um, now, like, is there a team that maybe has like a best chance to surprise? And is that that Pepperdine team? Or is it going to be someone like Portland who like started to have that come up last year? And are they going to make a next that next leap this year or who is or is there someone else maybe it's san diego or another team yeah i i think portland's issue is going to be that no one's going to sleep on them like i think nobody expected what they were going to do last year in uh shante leggins first year at the program completely new a bunch of new guys and they did very well they have everyone's attention so it'll be interesting to see what happens when they're sort of hunted a little bit because they're going to be sort of a consensus sort of sneaky favorite that could make the top four. Uh, a team that I, that I think could, I, I think you mentioned is San Diego. Uh, did they have two of the, the best, if you take Gonzaga out the picture, you could argue that they had two of the best transfers in the offseason, and Jaden Loer and, and Eric Williams, two guys who are double-digit contributors at the Pac-12 level. And clearly show they can play. Now they're going to come down to WCC they can easily dominate and they can have the best front court not named Gonzaga in the conference. And then if you assume that Wayne McKinney sort of has a breakout sophomore campaign, now that he has better talent around him, and then you add a uh, Weaver State transfer, a uh, SACU, a uh, Jawar, they, they, they have a very interesting starting five. And, and I think they could be a team that if the front court leads the way, could very well compete for a top four spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, San Diego, I feel like is going to be just like the the team to watch throughout the course of this season because of like all the changes and all the roster moves and Steve Lavin being the head coach. I think the, the maybe like the the headline of non Gonzaga news in the offseason was Steve Lavin taking over the helm there. Um, and as we kind of talk about some of those transfers, let's uh, transition and transfer over to the new 60 day rule um, that uh, was released just a couple of weeks ago and how this is going to impact. Uh, coaches, uh, players, schools. And so like with the new 60 day rule at beginning, it sounds like it's going to start the day after selection Sunday. And then we're going to get that, that two month window uh, to be able to kind of like have players move around. Yeah. So there's a lot of talk online about who, who can this affect and whatnot. I, there was a coach who uh, I, I believe, you know, anonymously said that, you know, if you're a, if you're an NCAA tournament team, you know, good luck. And my reaction to that is you, you have probably, what, 10 guys on your staff. It, it wouldn't be hard to have one of them to focus on the portal while you're doing that. And the reality is, regardless of whether there's a, a window or not, the transfer stuff happens all season long. Like, as someone who, who covers the sport, 
you hear whispers, you hear rumors all the time about guys who are portal candidates or, or could be going in there. So there are guys who will announce that they're transferring and no one would be surprised because everyone expected it. And when you, when you think about a lot of these guys, you know, they, they enter the portal and then 48 hours later commit to a team. That, that kind of strikes as the work was already done behind the scenes. Mm. So what, what it does sort of, it sort of organizes things and it allows coaches not have to have to wait till June, July to finalize the rosters. You know who's going to be on it. You know who's not. It also put, puts players in a position where you, you kind of have to know what you want to do. And, and it's going to be hard because players can come in and then your role looks we, you're not what you want it. Then guys, you could join a team that you think is going to look good, but then all of a sudden their top two players leave. So now what are you going to do? And like always, any any kind of rule involving the NCAA, there's ways to get around it. Like you, you looked at the last month with uh, Emmanuel Acott. He, he committed to Memphis, then decommitted, and then went somewhere else. So what happens to guys who end up decommitting outside the window? What, what, what happens with them? What happens with guys looking for waivers? What happens to winning, and this happens every year, four or five coaches get fired in the middle of summer out of nowhere. We saw this with LIU Brooklyn and other schools. What happens to those guys? Do they get their own window? And what happens there? And then, you know, uh, part of the issue with the waivers is everyone gets ran off, which is actually true in a lot of cases with guys lower on the roster getting told there's no scholarships. What happens if you get told that you're not going to be able to come back after the window? You know, will there be another whole waiver process to deal with? So it, it, it's a, a meaningful step to help organize. But like everything else that happens in, in involving the NCAA, there's going to be its own level of mess involving. Right. There's always like all these other like circumstantial cases and everything else that'll because like what it happens if like a coach gets fired and like, yeah, as you pointed out, like coach gets fired or like the coach has or school has to actually rehire a coach like late, later on in the process. And then of course they're going to want to go through their roster and probably go pick up some transfers, but their window will be sh shorter player. It also kind of seems like on the player front that like those get kind of, as you mentioned, like a lot of the work having already been done behind the scenes that previous connections are always, are already going to kind of play a factor in this. If the window is now smaller uh, for, for that. So do you see like, is there any like sort of like, because to me, it doesn't seem like the, there's a there's a real benefit one way or another based on school. It's just like really kind of, as you pointed out, just tightening up the the window. Yeah, no, I I don't think there's it'll be it'll come down to whether or not the schools are viable for players. Like it's same thing with recruiting. You know, if you're if you're Gonzaga, you're going to get your top transfer targets no matter what because you're Gonzaga and you have a history. Same thing with Kentucky or Duke, but also for uh, rebuilding programs. You know, I, I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh and I cover the Panthers. Did They brought in six transfers and a lot of them were sort of flying under the radar because some of them didn't even play and whatnot. So teams will always be able to get transfers. It's going to come down to which coaching staffs legitimately put in the work behind the scenes and once the window happens and if you want a guy, you'll be able to get him. Whether or not you're in the middle of the Sweet 16 run or your season ended in middle of February because you knew you weren't doing anything. If you, if you want a certain guy and you have the connections that previously built when you were recruiting them, you'll find a way to get them. All right. And then as, as we'll kind of like wrap up here, um, who do you, th who do you see as like the top four teams in this league right now? Obviously we're like, we know Gonzaga won, but who are the rest, of, who are the rest joining that group? Who's going to, be able to see a double, uh, at least one buy in the WCC tournament. Yeah, I, I think obviously Gonzaga's head and shoulders away, number one in the league. I think the question will be whether or not they get a loss or not. And it'll probably come down to whether or not they struggle against St. Mary's uh, slow paced offense or not, because that seems to be the only way to trip them up. But I think if you look at the, the second best, I, I, I want to give it to St. Mary's because I think they're just so consistent and they're a team that just loses games the least. But their front court's a concern because they lose both Matthias Toss and Dan Fotu. Fotu was kind of out of flavor with them, but he still was good. Like, is, is Mitchell Saxon going to be good enough at the five for them? That, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. But 
I trust them over San Francisco's new coach and, and, and the new assistant coach. He could very well be the next great next great leader, but I'm sort of going to you know bet on Randy Bennett. I think San Francisco's roster is second best in the league. You lose Jamari Bouye, but you keep Khalil Shabazz. Tyrell Roberts was really good at Washington State. He could be a star there. And, and, and then you, your, your front court saw, too. I think San Francisco's number three. BYU four, Mark, uh, Mark Pope's uh, obviously a great coach. I think Rudy Williams is going to be a solid guard, not as efficient as Barcelo, but, but he'll be fine. Uh, Fusini Traore is a star in the making. At the WCC level, I do have questions as to whether or not his size will work at the Big 12. But at least this upcoming season, he'll be great. My concern is who's their third best player? Is it Gideon George? Is it Texas A&M transfer, uh, Arkansas transfer, uh, Jackson Robinson? Could he break out? He's a former top 50 guy. But I think BYU, they're, they're consistently in the top four. So the, I think putting there is fine. And then San Diego, five. I, I think those are my top four non-Gonzaga teams. I think there's a pretty decent uh gap between those four and Portland, and then you can put uh, Pepperdine, Pacific, LMU, Santa Clara, sort of at the bottom tier of WCC. Sounds good. All right, Tristan, uh, thanks for hopping on and talking some college basketball. And so it, we're, I think everyone's excited to kind of get this going. We're only a couple months away, um, and uh, we'll be talking down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. All right, and I'll do it uh, for this episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. I want to thank Tristan Freeman one more time for joining us. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at HoopsNut351 and on Busting Brackets. Uh, and so, again, like if you be sure to subscribe, be sure to uh, follow me on Twitter at Post by Zach. You can subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming service. Also, uh, be sure to subscribe on YouTube if that's the way you'd rather go unofficial WCC hoops podcast on, on YouTube. And, um, and that'll do it. We'll, we'll see each other in a couple weeks and I will catch you later.